welcome to Plan B Sunday Worship here at the Monroe Congregational Church for Sunday, March 22nd. It is the fourth week of Lent. I'm here with Don and Kate parker Brigard to praise God and support each other through these challenging times. We thought we would start uh, this morning's worship with a good old-fashioned camp song. This is called The Love Round. If you know it, we encourage you to please follow along the PDF of the worship that, that we sent along to you. Join with us as either part one, part two, or part three. We'll begin together by singing one round together, and then we'll break into parts and we'll sing through it twice. Shall we? Love, 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 Christians, this is our call. Love your neighbor as yourself, for God loves us all. Love, 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 Christians, this is your call. Love your neighbors as yourself, for God loves us all. Thank you. Welcome back to worship. We have some announcements for the good of our faith community. Now is a very good time to let us know if you are not on our weekly email list. Please reach out so that the office and I can keep you updated and informed. The mission of our church is to incarnate God's love and work for a more compassionate, just, and peaceful world. And that work is as important as ever. Our receiver, John O'Rourke, would like me to remind you that you can mail or drop off your donations and pledges to the church office mailbox to the attention of our MCC receiver. Mail is gathered every day and a deposit is made once or twice a week. You can also arrange for electronic payment to MCC via your bank or make electronic payments via Vanco by clicking on the donate link on our church's website. You can get there by typing www.mcc-ucc-donate.html. All right, friends, it's been a week. Let's hold each other in our hearts in this moment of silence as we remember the light of Christ that always points us towards hope. And now, friends, let us join together in singing. Uh. Distance, connector of being, hear our prayer, 
In the midst of nonstop news stories about illness and scarcity, press conferences and cancellations, grant us quiet in our minds. In the midst of heightened anxiety about caregivers and caregiving, about health and hygiene, grant us calm in our hearts. In the midst of distance in our families, our faith communities, in our relationships with others, grant us connection during our physical separation. In the midst of our lives, in our gratitude and concerns, in our hopes and longings, grant us an abiding sense of your comfort. Amen. Who we are as a faith community is proclaimed by those gathered each Sunday in the words of our covenant. Let us say it together, appreciating each phrase as its call on our hearts. We declare our faith in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In holy covenant, we bind ourselves to God and each other, becoming devoted disciples and active apostles. We promise each other to be faithful in worship and in support of this church, whose Savior and Lord is Jesus Christ. In Christian love, we will care for and support each other. With the Bible as our guide, we willingly promise all that we are and all that we have to the fulfillment of God's kingdom. Freely we say these things, glorying in the joy of our salvation. our community finds time together to hold one another in our prayers and we do so now uh, because of privacy we are holding back on last names but we know um, that God knows we ask you God to be with Chris P in his fight against cancer with Jen N's mother Barbara with Jean and Linda and Eric and their families as they continue to miss George. Liz's mom and all those who are facing illness in hospitals or nursing homes that are on lockdown whose families are unable to visit. Those under quarantine whose home lives are already challenged by poverty, hunger, or domestic violence. Let us take a moment now in our hearts for silent prayer. Our brother Jesus, 
You who healed the sick and fed the hungry and cared for those whom society had cast aside. Be with us now and in the days ahead. Set aside our fear. Help us to understand our duty and obligations towards others and how your call for community at this time means isolating ourselves physically for the good of all. Walk with our caregivers, doctors, nurses, social workers, and CNAs as they deal with unprecedented challenges. Walk with all of our first responders, protect them and their families, support their sense of purpose, in a time when little makes sense. We pray for all of those who have tested positive for the virus, for all of those who worry they will. Ease the consequences of this virus on them all, whether it be physical, mental, or spiritual. We especially hold up those folks who are older or immunocompromised. We pray for parents, who have to explain what is going on to their children, but can't find the words to help them understand. We pray for children who have to explain what is going on to their parents who suffer from dementia. We pray for those who struggle with anxiety or depression on a normal day, who find this time to be too much to hold. Help us to keep our own anxiety at bay as we move forward. We pray for those who are afraid that they will face economic collapse, and those small business owners burdened with balancing decisions, decisions about the welfare of their employees and the welfare of their own families. We pray for teachers and students that they might look with hope toward the future. We pray for our leaders, who are limited creatures like every human being, even as we pray for mercy for our own limitations in times like these. We pray for our church, that it may focus on itself as a community of faith and continue to act accordingly. And we pray for peace that passes all understanding. We know that although we walk through the shadow of the valley of death, you are there to comfort and guide us, knowing our plight, loving us as your children. We ask all of this through the one God, who is mother and father of us all, as we pray together with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power, and the, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard the Sadducees disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. 
The Gospel of the Lord. My friends, if you feel like you're busier than ever, you're not alone. There's this myth circulating around that suddenly we have all this extra time on our hands, and that this time is basically a staycation where we spend our days catching up on our hobbies and binging Netflix and learning new languages to stave off the boredom. And for the first few days of this, our social distancing experiment, I thought I was doing it all wrong because I had much less free time than normal. I was stressed to the max with all that had to be done, and then I started to talk to other people and I realized I'm not alone. People working from home for the very first time are trying to learn new ways of doing their job. They're learning new apps, new communications, leaning into constant creativity which takes a lot more mental effort than doing business as usual. People who have always worked from home are trying to be as patient as they can be with fumbling coworkers and disrupted workflows. The people who still go into work, they're dealing with different guidelines and safety practices, cranky customers, the uncertainty of not knowing how long their job may last. And even the people who are retired have had their daily schedules uprooted. They're worried about friends, but unable to visit with them in person. They're worried that their volunteer work has been halted. They're worried about grandkids, but they're unable to swoop in and babysit them. They're worried about their own parents living in retirement homes, but unable to visit. And they're finding that checking in via phone multiple times a day is necessary but more time-consuming than ever. And yet, this whole generation of people who have been teased by their younger friends and family for not adapting to technology, they're suddenly leading video conference calls, they're live-streaming concerts and worship services, and spending more, on more time online in one week than they likely have all year. And now all of this sounds really impressive, but it certainly doesn't sound like a staycation to me. Parents who are suddenly home with kids are trying to learn how to be teachers and sports coaches and artists and scientists and chefs and even school counselors. This impossible balance of working from home and teacher parenting makes them want to pull their hair out, especially if they are already professional educators, trying to come up with plans for distance learning, all the while wrangling their own kids. Parents who are still going to work Many of our first responders, for example, they're coming home to anxious families whose routines have been uprooted and who need new kinds of care, meaning they're hustling all day and hustling all night. Parents who have always stayed home with their kids are sending their frazzled friends tips. Thanks for those, by the way. Filling in all of those supportive gaps where library programs and play dates and field trips once were it's probably safe to say that most parents stuck at home don't really feel like they're on a staycation right now. And as I've spent this time contemplating all these ways that so many of us have been forced to adapt, I have found myself craving the more simple things in life because the world, all of a sudden, seems really complicated. How about you? Well, friends, we're lucky because the narrative lectionary takes us back to the basics today. And it's a word that I need to hear, and maybe you do too. A version of today's text, which Don read, appears in one form or another in Matthew and Mark and Luke. But I like this one best because it's the only one in which his questioner, his adversary, becomes one of Jesus' followers. We know that there were people trying to challenge and trick Jesus all the time. People like Pharisees and Sadducees, Herodians, the chief priests and scribes. Pretty much anyone who held power in that dominant structure or who didn't like Jesus or his message tried to catch him in a gotcha moment. 
If they could only cause him to misspeak or mess up, it might discredit him in front of his disciples. Maybe if they were lucky, they could even disband the movement. But not today. Today in this text, the scribe doesn't ask Jesus a question to tr trick him or to challenge him. No, as it turns out, he's genuinely intrigued and he wants to know more. This anonymous scribe overheard Jesus having an argument with another scribe and he thought that he responded so well that he wanted to know more. And after Jesus tells him this commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, he had this beautiful affirmative moment with the scribe. Part of why Jesus' basic message to love God and love neighbor as yourself can feel so threatening is because he puts these two commandments above the law, above ritual, above sacrifice. Because guess who controlled those practices? Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, chief priests, and the scribes. It's like all this time they had behaved like gatekeepers. Being the ones who controlled the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, they were the intermediaries between the faithful people and God. But then Jesus comes along. He opens those gates wide and he says, Come, all of you have access to God and unconditional love and forgiveness. All you have to do is to love God with every part of your being and to love your fellow human beings and to love and value yourself. And you'll notice that he doesn't tell his followers not to follow the other commandments or not to keep the purity laws or to offer sacrifices. He simply says, love, this is the greatest commandment. So it's official. Love is the cornerstone. It's the basic building block of our faith. It's also the thing on which everything else must rest. And if you can't faithfully worship God or follow God's other commandments, if you don't first love God and love all God's people. This week, loving God's people means staying home, flattening the curve, sharing resources with your neighbor at a safe six-foot distance. What might it look like next week or a month from now, next fall? We don't know yet. I wish that I did because there's comfort, friends, when things are in black and white, when we know for sure what we can and can't do and when we can do it. And patience can run in really short supply. Could be rare as toilet paper. This loving our neighbor stuff is nuanced and it's complicated. Remember when Jesus told his people to love their neighbor as themselves, he didn't say with a little asterisk defining who that might be. To literally be someone's neighbor, meaning to have them close to you, either physically or emotionally, I have a hunch in these times. He'd advise us to draw the circle wide, to bring everyone in. And remember that we belong to each other. We are all interwoven all a part of humanity. We are as close to each other as we can safely get right now. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed. We all feel it. But we move forward, embracing the best of who we are and doing so together. So please be gentle with yourselves. Know that if you feel like you are busier than ever, or if you're having a hard time finding those quiet evenings you remember fondly from a week and a half ago, <laughs> you're not alone. We're all in this together. Love is messy and complicated, and it doesn't always have clear outcomes. But I know when I act out of love, I never regret my actions or my decisions. We're all struggling right now with how to be people of faith in ways we haven't before. As long as we stick together, we can figure this out. That scribe had a change of heart, turning away from the power and the judgment, turning toward love above all else. We can have a change of heart too, moving from fear to connection, 
from division to unity. May it be so, and may it be soon. Amen. Amen. Friends, for our final hymn together today, we are going to sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. We will sing all four verses. into your lives this week. May you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength and love others as you love yourself. And may God grant you justice and freedom. May Christ Jesus set you free for love. And may the Holy Spirit go where you go to protect you on your way. Amen.